Now let's take a look at heredity and environment as factors involved in intelligence. Heredity is estimated at 41%. Interestingly, it becomes a more important factor as we get older. There are two genes that are associated with intelligence, although somewhat indirectly, one affects brain size and the other one affects neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons. When we look at the correlation between identical twins on intelligence, we can see some interesting patterns. So one that we're going to look at is identical twins reared apart. So this group, and we're going to compare them with fraternal twins who are raised together, this group right below. And we can see that despite having different home environments, the identical twins have a higher correlation in intelligence than the fraternal twins. So we're looking at evidence that there is a strong genetic basis for intelligence. We can see that the correlation among identical twins who are reared together is 86%, reared apart is 72%. So there certainly does seem to be a decline in the correlation as the environments change as well. Let's take a look also at parents and children. So parents and children, we're going to see that the genetic similarity is 50%. And if the child is raised in the household with the parent, the biological parent, the correlation is 42%. If they're reared apart, it does drop to 22%. So again, we're looking at evidence that both genetic similarity and environmental similarity increase the correlation between intelligence and these individuals. Now let's also one, take a look at what it means to say that there's a positive correlation in, these, in the scores of parents and their children. Does it mean necessarily that the scores are similar? So this is actually just a, a reminder of what it means to say the two things are correlated. When there's a correlation, we're not saying that the scores are similar, but we're saying is that there is a consistent pattern or relation between them. If a child has parents with, say, a very high intelligence among their generation, that the child has, in a sense, a greater likelihood of being relatively more intelligent. But that doesn't mean that the two scores are going to be the same there are, because there are other factors. Your textbook has a way of thinking about it. And think of them as sort of being connected through a rubber band, right? So there's going to be a range. The role of the parents is more than just genetic. And so that means that there's going to be a range of scores that you're going to see in the, in the children. Now there is, of course, a controversial position with regards to the biological origins of intelligence. And it has to do with not so much just genetics, but the role of ethnicity and sometimes an assumption that ethnic differences correspond with clear genetic differences. The idea is that if we see that different ethnic groups, say in the United States, have differences in intelligence, can we then say that those differences are due to genetic differences between those groups? And that's sort of the genetic controversy. And so evidence for that position is that like identical twins raised apart have more similar IQ scores than with others from the adopted environment. So arguing that yes, genetics are important. And again, I don't, I am agreeing that genetics are very important in intelligence. But the other part of that argument is that differences in ethnicity and in, eth and in scores of ethnic groups are due to differences in genetics. That part, however, has not been supported through research. Socioeconomic status, for one thing, is a stronger factor than ethnicity. And remember that the correlation between parent and child is cut in half when the child is not reared with the parent, showing that the home environment is a big factor. In addition, an American Psychological Association task force found that there was no direct evidence of ethnicity-based IQ differences, that these group differences, when we see them, have no basis on genetic differences 
and are not due to the ethnicity per se. So in other words, they seem to be due to other things that, ha that correlate with ethnicity. For example, socioeconomic status. Now when we look at environmental effects, we actually do have lots of data on this. The one that we're going to focus on is on lead exposure. So lead accumulation is associated with lower IQ scores. And what we're going to look at here first at this top graph is the correlation between lead used in gasoline, shown here in the green line, and average blood lead levels, shown in red. And so what we're seeing is that between 1976 and 1980, as lead and gasoline became less prevalent, the amount of lead in the blood also declined. In other words, there's a really close relation between lead and gasoline and having higher levels of lead in the blood. The problem with this is that there's no safe amount of lead in the blood. So if we look at the bottom graph, we can see that even small amounts of lead are producing a decline in IQ scores. It's interesting to see this because for so many years there was lead in gasoline. Lead was is added to gasoline. Lead does not break down. It doesn't, you know, evaporate. Uh, so all the lead that was used in gasoline and in other fuels has settled. It's in our environment. And so although it's no longer in the air we breathe, it is still in the soil and in other sources. And we'll see why that's still important in a minute. So why is neural development so vulnerable to environmental hazards um, like lead exposure? And one factor is that the blood-brain barrier provides only partial protection during fetal life and early infancy. So that's obviously prenatally. Um, in addition, neural stem cells are very sensitive to neurotoxins like mercury and pesticides as well. Now I want to go back here and focus on Claire Patterson here because his name is closely tied to lead. He was a physicist at Caltech who noted that the estimates of the amount of lead were severely low and he discovered that the levels of lead that were in the air and in the environment around us and even in our foods was much higher than had been measured before and he became an advocate for reducing lead. It took, I believe, 30 years for lead to completely be banned or removed from gasoline. So are you curious about how elevated lead levels were in Flint, Michigan? So you may have heard about children in Flint, Michigan being exposed to high levels of lead through their drinking water. and. Um, what we can see is that the percentage of children with lead levels that are greater than five micrograms per deciliter increased noticeably. So we can see here that over the years, actually, the levels of lead in the blood were declining and the number or the percentage of children who had blood levels of lead above this threshold of five micrograms per deciliter started to decline and decline and decline, right? So this, we can see that their contamination essentially with lead was declining. And then we can see here this little blip where it goes up again. And this is at the point in time when the city switched its water to the Flint River and had higher levels of lead. Once again, again, putting children at risk at reduced intelligence. And then as soon as the water source was switched back to the or written to the prior source, we can see that lead levels declined. Now, what about the effects of infectious diseases? Turns out that globally, infectious disease is the best predictor of differences in IQ. So as an individual is exposed to more infectious disease, the intelligence definitely declines. And most researchers attribute this to, basically, there's so much that the body has to do to fight these infectious diseases that it leaves the brain essentially starved of nutrients, starved of the 
resources needed to develop, the brain's going to grow. It's going to like triple in size, right? During the first year of life. And so that's a huge amount of development and it's extremely energy intensive. And if the body's sort of fighting these different infectious diseases, it's going to limit the brain brain's development. 